These letters are part of the most mysterious language of the ancient world. Nobody can read or understand them. The women of the people who used it wore few clothes but much jewellery. They regarded animals like this bull with veneration. Their religion involved the worship of a god who is usually shown seated like this with his right hand on his knee and an elaborate hairstyle. The people who practiced this religion lived some 4,000 years ago in this extraordinary brick metropolis, the city of Mohenjo-Daro. Mohenjo-Daro itself stands two or three miles today from the river Indus, th that line which you can see just below the horizon running into the distance. The Indus is one of the great rivers of the world. It's the backbone of West Pakistan as it curves and meanders a thousand miles from the Himalayas to the Arabian Sea. The civilization that produced Mahendradaro is called the Indus Valley Civilization. It spread over a much larger area than the civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt of the same period. Mahendradaro was one of the two greatest cities of this little known civilization of the ancient East, and it is the subject of this program. Mahendradaro was discovered as recently as 1922. It's not every day that a new civilization is brought to light with great cities and the elaborate organization of civic life and well-developed knowledge of writing. Uh, so the event was an exciting one. The ancient civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia had been known for a long time. Now, here was a third great civilization, almost as old, covering a thousand miles of the subcontinent of India. Research has shown that it lasted from before 2500 BC to something like 1500 BC. About a hundred sites have now been discovered. Uh, most of these sites are villages, but there's also the city of Harappa, which is about the same huge size as Mahendradaro, though there's not so much of it to be seen today. The origins of this civilization, like much else about it, are a mystery. But let us approach the city of Mahendradaro and see for ourselves what we can make of it, with the help of archaeology and a little reasonable imagination. The first point about Mahendradaro is its great size. These are only some of the sections that have been cleared amongst the tamarisk scrub and red desert sand. Perhaps a twelfth of it has been revealed by excavation. But that is enough to show how vast it is, three or four miles round. Entering by a main street, we are at once struck by its width and straightness. Then we have no difficulty in telling what sort of vehicle once used it. The ox cart of today has scarcely changed from its 4,000-year-old predecessor, whose shape is known to us from this terracotta model. A number of these models have been found at Mahendradaro of slightly different types. They were probably children's toys. Turning at right angles into another street, we get a feeling of law and order from the guard rooms, still used by the modern watchmen, which stand at the junctions of roads and lanes. This is confirmed by the symmetrical layout of Mahendradaro as seen from the air. It's also shown in this checkerboard plan, drilled and regimented by a civic architect whose word was law. This is in sharp contrast to the contemporary city of Ur in Mesopotamia. The irregular meanderings of the main street of Ur are a very different story. Returning to Mahendradaro, uh, we leave the main streets and turn into one of the side lanes. Here the high blank walls with few doors and fewer windows emphasize the uniformity of the street architecture. No decoration now breaks the monotony, and this absence of individuality is something that we'll notice everywhere in the city, although, of course, there may at one time have been a certain amount of carved woodwork. The walls, as preserved, are made almost exclusively of baked brick in the so-called English bond, that's to say, alternate rows of headers and stretchers with mud mortar in between. Upper stories were probably built of timber. 
Such windows as there were probably had gratings in them like this. And if it all seems very monotonous now, at least the varied decorations of the household pottery can perhaps give us an idea of how the carpenter and painter may have relieved the original brickwork with their designs. Finally, down a dogleg turn in a lane which helped to break the force of the prevailing wind, we come to a well-preserved and typical house. Immediately inside the door, a cage protects a piece of the original mud plaster, which probably normally uh, covered most interior walls. Next inside the entrance is a small court, with a potter's lodge facing the doorway. From there, a passage leads to the central courtyard of the house, but we stop on the way to visit a bathroom with a well in it. Wells, like this better preserved one in another house, Baths and cleanliness were a feature of the inhabitants' lives. Returning to our house, we come next to the main courtyard, round which the life of the house would revolve. Off it were the various rooms for sleeping, eating and cooking. Finally, in one corner, is a brick staircase which leads to a now-vanished upper storey, probably, as I said, largely built of wood. But now what about the people who once trod these stairs? We can discover a certain amount from the pieces of statuary that have been found, like this portrait bust. This shows it was fashionable to shave the upper lip. The beard is clearly shown while the upper lip is bare. This is confirmed by the discovery of a rather battered bronze razor now in the Karachi Museum. Another point is that men took some trouble over their closely cropped wavy hair, which was done up into a bun at the back. This is not such an impressive portrait, but with his neat beard and the twinkle in his eye, he strongly reminds me of an old professor friend of mine. The women, too, went in for elaborate jewellery and headdresses. These figures aren't portraits in the same way as the male head, but they do show that the women of Mahendradaro made up in jewellery what they lacked in clothes. Here a Pakistani girl, with the help of a bronze mirror, which some beauty of Mahendradaro once used some 4,000 years ago, is showing us some of their jewellery which was found in the excavations. These necklaces were mainly made of semi-precious stones like carnelian and jasper, and some would not look at all unfashionable today. This one, with its three gold pendants in the centre, is particularly attractive. Bangles, both of bronze and gold, were obviously popular too. And notice the girdle particularly. It's made of long tubes of red carnelian and is the image of the one worn by, the, by uh, some of the terracotta models. Other evidence we have of the lady's interest in makeup is this pot of black eyeshadow and the bronze sticks that were once used to put it on. They also had nail cutters. And combs. And on a more homely note, needles and buttons. Another familiar domestic object they had was a baby's feeding bottle. You must forgive me if I don't handle it quite as it should be. For the older children, there was this charming animal, which still works quite well today. Then there were marbles. And gamesmen like these. They were used for some sort of game, like chess or draughts. For grown-up children, uh, there was that old pastime dice. After which, if you were bored, you could always say, bring on the dancing girls. 
The dancing girl on the right is in fact one of the most remarkable finds from Mahendra Daro. She hasn't got many clothes on, but she carries all her wealth on her left arm. And with her saucy look and easy posture, she really is a charmer. Less obtrusive members of the household were the pets. Was this a cage for a pet bird? It may have been. But there's no doubt what made these footmarks on a wet brick. A dog, perhaps this very one, whose owner had obviously taken pride in his handsome collar. Now, so much for the contents of our house. But there's one other point about the arrangements of the now-vanished upper story I must make. In other houses, there exist the remains of an upstairs lavatory, a convenience that is not often found even 2,000 years later in Pompeii. In another house, you can see surviving a good example of the carefully built chutes by which waste was drained into the covered brick drains of the main street. There's one on the left. Uh, the brick path is modern. The drains of Mahendradaro were thus far in advance of those in many towns today. These drains led to, to brick-built manholes you know, with a number of drains leading into them. These were cleared by municipal sanitary squads who in some cases left an adjacent heap of debris for modern rediscovery. Turning off the main street, our next call is at a building which seems to have been a shop. This still has the resting places in the floor where the pots holding the shopkeeper's goods used to be put. The shop fronts on the street, and this one was near a crossroads too, so no doubt it had a, a flourishing trade. The kilns or furnaces where the pots were made used to be outside the city, but in the later stages they were built in amongst the buildings, like this one. That's its outline with the entrance here. The pottery they produced was mostly wheel-turned and red in colour. Small pots like this are notable as being the only ones with a potter's mark, and a fine one it is too. But now uh, look at this set. A perfectly good child's tea set copied from the large originals. Another point about Mahindradaro pottery, uh, like these examples here, is its resemblance to the pottery which is still made in the villages near Mahindradaro today. I went to look at one of these village potteries, which is less than a mile from Mahindradaro. The wheel is foot-operated. These are some of the products. This pot has a pattern which is almost identical with that on another piece of pottery in the Karachi Museum from one of the levels of Mohenjo-Daro. Another aspect of trade which has a special interest is these weights. A large number have been found, all of very accurate and finished workmanship. This scale, which is partly reconstructed, was probably used by a jeweller. Uh, turning to another building near the shop, uh, we come past a, a guard room. to a, an enclosure that may once have held a sacred tree. Its special character makes one think that this unusual building may have been a temple. There are two stairways at the back. They, they lead to a, a room whose purpose may perhaps be deduced from a sculptured figure found there. Was this a temple devoted to the worship of the monkey-faced god? 
And perhaps this other figure uh, found there represents a priest. His eyes were originally inlaid with shell, and trefoils on his cloak probably represent stars. They're a common religious motive in the ancient Middle East. We would know more about their religion if we could read their script. 396 of its signs are known, and it's still in a pictographic state. That's to say, the signs are still recognizable like this fish, or this uh, sun or wheel. It's not like any other known script, and unless a bilingual inscription is found, it's unlikely ever to be translated. Another point is that it's read Bustophidon. That's to say, backwards and forwards, like this. Most of the letters are found on these seals, which are one of the, the outstanding artistic achievements of these people. They were probably used for stamping bales of goods or, or storage jars, amongst other things. The carvings on them are masterpieces of controlled realism. Possibly they represent proper names and titles. They're usually a little smaller than a matchbox in size. Besides animals, there are designs like this multiple cross the splayed eagle, and even the swastika. Mostly they seem to have some religious significance. This beast is often shown with a sacred brazier in front of it. Other religious scenes show this three-headed monster with antelope heads and a bull's body, or this seated figure with a horned headdress, perhaps the prototype of the Hindu god Shiva. In this seal, the deity has another kneeling figure beside it, while below, seven votaries with long pigtails and headdresses take part in a ritual dance. But for the strongest expression of religious activity, perhaps, we should go to the citadel of Mahendradaro. This is the remains of an artificial hill which once dominated the city. It was built up on a platform of mud, brick and mud, and stood some 30 feet above the rest of the town. Today, the remains are crowned by a Buddhist monument, a stupa, which was built when the Romans were in England, though Mohenjo-Daro was then 2,000 years old. Leaving then this later Buddhist monument, we find amongst the earlier ruins on the citadel one of the most remarkable of all the buildings of Mohenjo-Daro, the ceremonial bath. The great bath, which was probably used for ceremonial cleansing, is approached by steps which once had timber treads set in asphalt. In one corner, uh, is the outlet drain. The floor of the bath, now rather battered, was a remarkable piece of work, with the bricks laid very closely together, with very fine joints to stop the water draining away. Truly, this is one of the most remarkable relics of the ancient East. The outlet drain becomes this high tunnel, roofed with flat bricks, the nearest they got to an arch. Water for the bath was supplied by this big well. Just beyond the great bath is a block which contains eight rooms opening off a central passage. The entrances are so arranged as to give the occupants privacy. Each room has a staircase which led to an upper floor. Lighting was from a lamp which went in a niche in the wall. The floor was made waterproof by finely jointed brick, so that after any ceremonial washing, the water would run uh, down to the drain and be carried away. Were these the dwelling places of priestly rulers who governed the vast Indus Valley civilization? At least it is not difficult to see in this face the haughty disdain of a governing official. Another aspect of their government is reflected in this building, the granary, for grain was the city's wealth. It fed the citizens and was used to pay the taxes. The front of the granary was originally laced with timber, which quickly decayed, a sign that it was an early building built by people who were newcomers and unused to the climate. Above that was a loading platform where sacks of grain were hauled up before being stacked inside. 
we were able by excavation to discover this plan of the granary. The crisscross passages serving to circulate the air so necessary for the preservation of the grain. There are other relics of their agriculture. This is a quern uh, for rubbing grain or spices. And here are some actual wheat grains, preserved because they were burned through the carelessness of some ancient housewife. The grain from the villages up and down the Indus Valley was probably brought to Mohenjo-daro in ships like this one, scratched on a piece of pottery. One thing is certain. The country round the city didn't then consist of tamarisk scrub and desert. Evidence of the difference of climate in ancient times comes from the seals, which show jungle animals like the rhinoceros or the elephant, with which the artists were obviously very familiar. Returning to the citadel, these towers were found quite recently. They are part of its defensive system. Between the towers was a rampart where we found a pile of clay missiles, possibly hurled by the defenders there. It does not seem a very effective method of repelling an enemy, but the unmilitary character of this civilization is confirmed by its weapons. They are neither strong nor warlike. But for all that, the dominion of the priestly rulers of Mohenjo-daro lasted for a thousand years. For a period as long as from the Norman conquest of the present day, there is no sign of change in their habits, arts or way of life. Now, you may be asking, how did this great city, with its vast and elaborate organization, come into being? Uh, we don't know for certain. It seems to have been derived from the villages in the Bluchistan Hills, but it owed almost everything to its spacious setting in the plains and to the determination with which its builders faced new problems there. In the spring, the Indus River comes down in a great flood, swollen by mountain snows. It overflows its banks far and wide and refertilizes the great tracts of country which it drowns. It was thus a challenge which compelled the valley dwellers to unite in controlling and exploiting it. Civilization on a large scale was the result. We have very few clues as to when this happened because throughout the Indus Valley civilization remained very isolated. But there are one or two a seal of the Indus Valley uh, type it has been found in Mesopotamia, in the city of Ur, at a level that can be dated approximately to 2350 BC. Then this piece of decorated stone, part of a box shaped like a hut, is of a well-known Mesopotamian type that was found at Mahendradaro. So was this cylindrical seal. It was rolled over the object to make its impression. These seals were very, were very common in Mesopotamia, but are rare amongst the square seals of Mahendra-Daro. Summarizing then, the finding of Indus-type seals in Ur and of Mesopotamian stonework and cylinder seals in the Indus Valley uh, show that this civilization was well established by 2300 BC. It lasted for perhaps a thousand years. During that time, uh, there were a few trading contacts with the outside world, but mostly the inhabitants were left to lead their well-regulated and peaceful, if somewhat monotonous and uninspired lives. You can see here how a brick street has been relayed uh, on the crumble of leveled off bricks and rubbish that has accumulated over its predecessor during many years. And here are two wells that have been gradually built up as the city level rose with time so that when the excavators clear down to the original level, they, they stand up like factory chimneys, evidence of the long, peaceful growth of the city. Then, about 1500 BC, something happened. Sudden tragedy brought this ancient civilization to a violent end. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are back in 1500 BC and are looking out over the straight streets and brick houses of Mahendra-Daro. Suddenly, smoke and flames begin to rise amongst them. And up one of the main streets, there streams a horde of swordsmen led by a swaying figure in an outlandish chariot. By the chariot pole crouches the charioteer. 
and every now and then the warrior beside him fits an arrow to a short, stocky bow and discharges it into the panic-stricken groups of fleeing citizens. At another spot, uh, some of the townsfolk cower beside a well where they were drawing water when they first heard the dreadful sounds of the city's feet. Two of them are now climbing the stairs and have reached the street when the invading mob closes up on them. They drop and are instantly trampled into the sand. A burly fellow with, the raised, with a raised sword turns onto the wellhouse stairs and cuts down a woman who is struggling up them. She falls backwards across the steps, and the ravening horde sweeps on. The story I'm telling you is not fantasy. It is a literal interpretation of actual discovery. This is the place where one of the massacres took place. Thirty-four centuries after it happened, the archaeologists of the 20th century dug and found these bones of the massacred, mute evidence of how an age-long civilization perished within the hour. Moreover, we can relate this evidence with the earliest literature of India, the Rig Veda, uh, which, it is agreed, tells in a traditional and uh, symbolic way uh, of the Indus Valley uh, and its invasion by the Aryans. The hymns in the Rig Veda make it clear that the mobile, cityless Aryan invaders differed at every point from the long static citizens which they invaded. The Aryan war god Indra is called the Fort Destroyer. He shatters a hundred ancient castles. He uh, rends forts as age consumes a garment. In the past, it was supposed that these citadels were mythical or at the most palisaded refugees. But the discovery in 1944 of walls and towers like these at Mohenjo-Daro uh, goes far to confirm the literal truth of the epic tradition. These Indus fortifications were in all probability the actual fortifications that fell to Indra, uh, the fort destroyer, and uh, his Aryan followers. Uh, climatic, economic, and political deterioration uh, may have weakened the Indus Valley civilization, uh, but its ultimate extinction uh, seems to have come from the hand of the Aryan invader. Sand and dust then covered its ruins, but fortunately for us, enough remains to tell us a little about the character of one of the earliest civilizations of the world.